Hey, what's up? You're listening to the Wingless Podcast. And today's podcast is going to be so cool and different in a way because I've got an, uh, another guest, you know, a new guest on the blog. His name is Marcelo Biedma and he's a friend of mine from university, from Philologia Inglesa. And he's different, you know, he's different from my voice because you must be getting really tired of my voice, you know, every day over and over listening to my voice so he's got an american accent and i think that's pretty useful and pretty interesting for your learning because if you only listen to my voice um you're gonna get you know comfortable you're gonna get in your comfort zone you know la zona de confort so it's good it's always very good to listen to different accents and different people and girls and boys and old people and young people and kids and okay so the more different the people i have on the blog the better so that's one of the reasons why today's podcast is going to be interesting and good for you but that's not the only one there are more reasons and you know secondly this podcast and um, because of some problems that i had with my connection and because it's always difficult to you know to record uh, a conversation with people for example marcelo right now he's living in in germany okay so it's always hard to to have a good quality on skype you know i try my best but it sometimes is hard and you know because it's been quite difficult to find the, the best quality for the audio you're gonna listen to the conversation with a different microphone And, you know, it's going to sound like a phone conversation, you know, una conversación de teléfono. So it's good. And this is very, very good for your listening because it's a challenge, you know, a challenge, something new, something that pushes you, un reto. So it's going to be more difficult than listening to a perfect voice on a podcast recorded at home, you know. So this is more like the real English that you would find in the streets, for example, or if you go to a Starbucks and you want a coffee and people are talking in the background, okay? So I'm, I'm going to give you show notes, you know, on the blog post, okay, a, a summary, un resumen, so you can follow the conversation if you get lost, okay? So I'm going to try to help you. And the third reason, the final reason why this podcast rocks you know, why this podcast is so cool. It's because, you know, we're going to speak a little bit about um, American culture and the American accent. And so you, you will not only listen to a different person, but you will also um, get the opportunity to, to learn how to speak with an American accent. Something very important in, in American English, you know, the R, la R, Americana. So... Just to, to let you know, you know, it was a heads up and now we're going to have a pause and then you will start with the interview, okay? Marcelo Vietma. So here we are again. Um, thanks for giving the interview. And, you know, the first thing that I would like to, to speak about is, you know, basically, who are you? Um, what's your story? What's your relationship with English or with languages in general? You know, can you tell a little bit about yourself? Um, well, guys, uh, hi there. My name is Marcelo. I'm 24 years old. Um, I was born in Cartagena, so I'm a proud uh, Murciana. <laughs> And the reason why I decided to study English uh, at the uh, university It's because when I was in high school, I went to the United States uh, to spend my last year in high school there. I had the chance to live with an American family uh, to learn about their culture. And I really liked the fact that I could communicate with them in a different language. I found that uh, fascinating. So by the time I got back to Spain, I got back to Murcia, I said to myself, well, I would like this to continue. I would like to, to keep on improving my language skills. And also, um, back then when I was 18, I took the decision of... Um, of learning a second, a third language in this case. And that was German. So that was six years ago. 
And uh, ever since, uh, I've been traveling a lot. I've lived uh, two years in the United States. I have also lived uh, two years in Germany. And uh, my relationship with uh, languages is a an ongoing one. Uh, I'm still working on it. And uh, hopefully, uh, I will keep it for the rest of my life. Okay, that's beautiful. You know, that's very, very nicely put. Okay, so that's the story. Now you you know who Marcelo is, what his story is. Um, now you mentioned that you, I mean, the two lovers, language lovers of your life are German and English. And yeah. now I would like to, you know, to focus, I mean, first, later we can speak about, you know, how, you, how you're learning and approaching German. But now let's, you know, let's speak a little bit about English. Like, yes. I mean, how did you learn English? What's your, I mean, what were your techniques or the resources that you used or what do you think helped you the most, like when you were learning or how did you approach the learning process? Well, um, to be quite honest, I didn't do, I didn't do anything special by the time I was in, uh, at school in, in Spain. I used to play online video games. Uh, so That's I had so cool. to speak. <laughs> Yes, so I had to speak with a microphone with uh, people from different countries. I actually I was in a in a internet group with uh, Danish people from Denmark, so I was the only one who had to speak in English, and that actually helped me out a lot. Ah, okay. By the time I went to the United States, it was a very natural thing. Just by uh, living with this family, I almost unconsciously acquired the language. Of course. I didn't learn English the same way, for example, I've learned German, okay? Uh, but I can, I can relate the experiences with English to German. For example, um, uh, the time that I've been learning German, I've, I've been trying to think of how I learned English back in the day. And uh, I think the most important way, the most, the most important thing you have to do is to, uh, to lose your fear, to forget your fear, and to be able to go out and communicate with people and... And if you say something stupid, well, you've said something stupid. You can laugh about it. You can have fun. It's all good. It's all you're trying. You are in the process of learning. So of course you're going to make mistakes. That happened to me in English. Well, not the same way as it ha it has happened in German. But yeah, that's pretty much uh, how it all happened. Okay, that's good. That's cool. Um, you know something I really really love about what you said is the online game thingy. I just love, you know, you, you know, I love video games. When, when I was younger, I used to love them even more. And I think learning through playing online video games is so cool. You know, I've got this student, um, I think his name, yeah, Daniel. He came to the, to the intensive course in, you know, for a first certificates preparation course and, and he would play LOL, you know, League of Legends. Yeah. I think, I think he played League of Legends or maybe another one, Counter Strike or Battlefield. I can't remember now, but he was so good. You know, he, he, he never studied before in an academy, not, you know, he, he never took it really, really seriously, you know, in an academic way, but he would speak a lot through the microphone and he had to speak with native speakers. And there are a lot of examples of guys who learned to speak English online, you know, playing online. And, you know, that's what, what learning a language is about, isn't it? Like communication, finding yeah. r real people. And I mean, you can either write or you can speak, but you have to communicate with them. You yes. have to try. That's a real thing. That's a, and that's very interesting what you said. And another thing that you said, obviously, is uh, the apprehension. You know, you don't have to be timid or shy. You have to be outgoing, um, you know, try yeah. to speak. And I mean, come on, you make mistakes. Yeah. You know, get over you it. Try, you have to try. And uh, as I've said, if you make a mistake, well, you made a mistake. Uh, there's no problem about that's, it. That's life. You know, that's how it works. That's how you advance and you learn and you make progress. Yeah, cool. Okay, that's pr pretty, pretty cool. Um, now, for example, you you took English. I mean, you, you spoke English in, in the USA when you were there. And uh, you know, I, I suppose one of the some of the listeners have noticed that that you have a different accent. You know, yes. <laughs> you have an, a, a very very you know marked uh, American accent, and you know they are very very used to my accent, which is I mean I don't think it's British, but it's kind of you know in the middle. It's not very very okay. strong either. So could you tell the listeners of that way a little bit about your accent? I mean, what are the main differences between American English and British English, or you know, why do you think? 
Well, I mean, I mean, if you go, I mean, first of all, I gotta say that I'm I'm very proud of my accent. I I like my accent. Uh, I know so you I, do. Like the United States, uh, I had a good time there, so I'm proud of my accent. Um, on the other hand, what I would say, uh, I think, keeping a, a bit of the background of the accent, uh, you have to think of the U.S. as a uh, a country of immigrants that came together, and everyone had. Uh, his or her own accent and they have to build a, a type of English, a sort of English that was easier to understand and easier to learn than British English. I know for most people who haven't been in contact with American with American English might think that British it's easier. I would defer. I would say no. I would say the American accent is easier. It's easier. Because it's 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 because it was it was it was created in a country made out of immigrants, pretty much people who had to learn the language, just as you guys. The main difference is, well, uh, of course, you would have to go into the uh, realm of uh, phonetics. I think uh, in American in the American accent, you pronounce everything. You pronounce the R at the end of words. Yeah, that's what I was getting into. You know, I I would like to to focus on the on the R because you know last a couple of weeks before I published one of the articles on the phonetic course, Curso English Phonetica, and one of the main differences between the you know the British English and the American one is the R. You know, like Peter yes. Peter Griffin. And- yes, yes, exactly. So there are two main things. I would say the tap. And the R, okay? Uh, there is a word that, um, that it's, it's perfect to explain this, okay? For example, the word uh, beta. And that, that would, I would say that with a British accent. That's uh, mejor in Spanish. Beta, you say better. Better. In English, okay? The tap is basically a T that is in between vo- uh, vowels. Exactly. That you do not pronounce... You pronounce like a like a like a like a soft R, better. Like be- be- better. Of better. Exactly. And then also another characteristic of the American accent is that the R at the end of the word is always pronounced. So in in British accent, in the British in British English you have better, and in American English you have better. So you can see you pronounce also the last R. Does this make the language easier? Well, it's a subjective opinion. Uh, I think it does. I think it does. I think, you know, for, for Spanish speakers, it does actually, because we, we've got the, you know, la ere, so we pronounce it in a, in a lot of situations. So I think it's, you know, for example, when you say a lot of, or a lot of, a lot of, so it's, I think it's more comfortable actually to pronounce an R. Yeah. Yeah. Also, and, and, and this is a, of course, a, a subjective opinion. Um, w- once I had, I had the chance to, uh, to discuss this with a professor at the university. And uh, I had the chance to say something. And she looked at me and said, wow, you have such an American accent. Why do you speak like an American? And I said, uh, well, because I've lived there and I really like the American accent. And she said to me, well, but you know, English comes from England. English comes from the UK. You shouldn't speak like a British guy. <laughs> and I looked at her. Oh, and said, you know, muddy, yeah, muddy water. That was, a, that was a low hit. Okay. And, and. <laughs> And I said, okay, I'm going to explain you why do I like the American accent better. If you go to the UK, and this is my subjective opinion, this might be wrong, but I, this is what I think. You go to the UK and you try your best to speak like a British guy, British people are going to remember you. You're not from here, okay? They don't make you feel at home. In a way, it's, it's a European thing. Whereas if you go to the United States and you speak literally like this hey my name is marcelo and i say tacos, <laughs> and i love to play football and, all this uh, and eat tacos yeah they're going to look at you and they're going to say hey man oh you have an accent we love you come over eat with us so they welcome you the, yeah yes when i've been to the uk i haven't felt at home when i've been to the us no matter what accent you have i felt at home that's why i choose to speak like an american of course this is a subjective opinion some of you guys might think that I'm that I'm wrong. Well, it's all good. No, it's all good. It's it, you know that's a beautiful thing to have different opinions, and you know, and that's that's really really cool what you said because um well you know we all have had good and bad experiences you know with different countries, but I think I, I can see what you mean. Like I think the European 
you know, way of thinking, you know, the mindset is different. And even though I, I, you know, I love English, I can say, you know, I always tell my students and everyone, you know, when I was starting, when I was studying in, in Chester in the UK, I, I, you know, I, I feel, for example, when I went to Ireland, for me, it was a lot better. You know, I felt more at home and I felt closer to Spain when I was in Ireland. I love Ireland and I love my, you know, the few Irish people that I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I think it made a difference. You know, I, I'm not particularly fond of the, of the British mindset or, you know, the average English man. You know, I'm not a very, very well, good you know, fan. Of... If, it also happens today in Germany. In Germany, uh, I try my best to sound as German as I can. And sometimes I could say that I sound quite German. But you always get the look. They yeah. always look at you and say, Like you aren't from here. You are from, you are from the South. You are a South guy. Okay. So you're not from here. And that's something that makes you uncomfortable from time to time. Yeah. I think, yeah. I can see what you mean. Totally. Like the USA is very, very cool in, a, in so many ways. And, and so is Ireland, for example, or even Scotland. You know, I met some people. Now that we're talking about, we're talking about the independence, the survey. Uh, but yeah, I, I met some people. I met, uh, I made a friend from Scotland when I was in Chester and he was definitely far better and, you know, a really, really nice guy. And he was very, very outgoing, open. So yeah, I think, yeah, it depends on the country. Obviously, this is all subjective. Yeah, course, let's, let's try to make this clear. You go to England, you're going to find most people are, are good people and beautiful people. It's just, there is a, uh, yeah, it's a, a just... percentage, a percentage of the population that ain't go, that they're not going to like you the same way. For example, as uh, the uh, as, as in the United States. But I mean, with this, we're not trying to say don't go to England. <laughs> no, of course, it's no, no, no. I mean, we all know England is really, really cool. It's just, yeah, it's a matter of preferences, you know. It, exactly. it's, it's just, you know, for example, I think, I feel Ireland goes more with my personality. Is that, that's it. But, you know, for some people, England might be perfect, you know, awesome, terrific. Yes. Okay. Good. That's really, really cool. Um, now I would like to, to ask you about a tricky topic, like, for example, exams. Yes. You know, the, the difference between just speaking English, you know, being fluent and being able to communicate and having the skills to pass an exam. What do you think about, you know, the Cambridge exams in Spain or the, you know, the, the TOEFL that you have to do to, to go to the USA? Or, I mean, what's, what's your opinion? I mean, what, what advice would you give to someone trying to pass an exam? Because I know you've been through a lot of exams when we were at university. Yes. So what yes. do you think? You know, a lot of the listeners of this blog, they come to the blog because they want to pass, you know, the PET exam or the first certificate. Um, well, I will start with the TOEFL. Uh, and then I'll move to the Cambridge exams. Uh, there's a big difference between those two. Uh, the TOEFL is yeah. uh, thought, what well, the TOEFL <clears throat> tries to assess is your ability to communicate. And that's it. It doesn't look that much at, at your grammar. It doesn't take that much attention at uh, how well you distinguish the meaning of two words. They just want to see if, if you're able to communicate, if you're able to, uh, to, to make follow yourself, a class, for example. Yeah. Yes, to make yourself be understood. So it's a whole different thing. For me, to prepare the TOEFL, the most important thing would be going out, talking to people, trying to meet a bunch of friends from England, uh, Australia, Canada, the United States, talk to them, get used to talking to them, uh, watch, watch movies, uh, read if you can. And then uh, I think you would have a shot. You have a shot. As long as you're able to keep a conversation with someone uh, who's a native speaker in English, you have a shot at the TOEFL. Yeah, and I, you know, I've, I've prepared some people and it's a, it's a different ball game. Yeah, it's only, you know, it's based on reading mostly, not very, not a lot of writing. You don't have to write. And yes, it's, it's only yeah. listening, reading. It's only, you know, passive skill. So, yeah. Yes, and if you, if you talk and you say something wrong, but they, they still understand you, that's going to be enough. That's going to be enough. Yeah. Then you, when we move on to the Cambridge exams, the Cambridge exams are completely different. Because they are, they are a lot more picky. That huh. means that uh, uh, they're going to, to take a look at how good your grammar is and how great your vo vocabulary mastery is. So in that sense, I think it requires a lot more of a study. Um, I think 
in my opinion, that's of course my view, uh, the key to do uh, a good Cambridge exam is to read a lot, to be able to read a lot on a daily basis, to get used to reading in English. Uh, for example, the way that I started, instead of looking at things in Wikipedia, Wikipedia in Spanish, I started off with Wikipedia in English. That was a trick for me. I mm -hmm. said, okay, I'm going to look up this information. Instead of doing it in Spanish, I'm going to look it up in English. That helps you out at the beginning. That uh, gives, you, gives you a boost at the beginning. Yeah. And then also trying to write. And this is a tricky thing. Uh, either you're going to a, an academy where a teacher is going to help you out with the grammar, or you have native friends, native speakers who are your friends, who are going to correct your text. That's a very important thing. Because I think uh, the speaking part in the Cambridge exams can be done you can learn some uh, some sentences, just memorize them and tell them and, and just say them in the exam. Yeah, it's just puke. <laughs> just, just, yeah, exactly, just, just spit, spit out those, those sentences. You can memorize that and still pass the exam. The listening part has a lot, uh, has a lot to do with how, mu how, many, how much movies you watch, exactly. with uh, how good you can understand. Some people understand better, some people understand worse. But then uh, the reading part, they're always going to try to trick you. They're always going to present you with a lot of words that are very strange. And uh, the writing part, you have, to, you have to nail it. That's what we say in the United States. Nail yeah, it. Nail. You have to do it perfectly. So um, the writing part, if you are making a lot of grammar mistakes, they're going to say, this guy, it doesn't matter if we understand the text, this guy cannot write properly. So I think the focus should go on, on, on reading, reading a lot, uh, vocabulary, knowing a lot of words, mm -hmm. and also writing. And then the, uh, the speaking and listening parts would be secondary. That, that's what I've done, and it, helped, it, it was okay for me. Okay. You know, I kind of like what you say. Um, you know, because at the beginning you mentioned that learning vocabulary is the key, you know, to starting and to having yes. a good foundation. And to improve your reading in an in an official exam, you have to know a lot of vocabulary. Yeah, that's it. You have to read a lot. And I think the more you read, the better of writing you become, you know? Because you're used to how people naturally speak when they write, how they create sentences, what connectors they use. So you don't have to think like, oh, this is the rule. Uh, yeah, because however goes out. No, no, no. I mean, you, you're so used to reading things in English that it becomes natural. Like, I know exactly. this sounds good, you know? I, I just and also Dave, and also Dave, if you read, for example, a book in English, a novel. Oh, that's so cool. Within within the text, you have descriptions, you have dialogues, you have you have all sorts of texts, and 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 it's a passive it's a passive type of learning. I think reading is key to learning any language. Yeah, you can then you can change your mobile phone into English. You can use video games in English. You can you can read, for example, just for the listeners who are listening right now. Um, on the blog, I've got, if you go to recursos on the menu, there is a, there is a post where I explain how to use graded readers. Do you remember graded readers when we were studying at university? Yeah. It's a novel, yes. it's literature, but it's adapted to people who are studying. It's so good. You know, I had a lot of fun and you learn a lot and you can practice and real, you know, you, you read the real thing. And I think yeah. that's key and listening okay you say it's not important for me i think it's really really important because this the whole website is based on the listening because you know to if you want to pass the cambridge exam you don't have to to pass all the parts so if you do well at oh, all sorry, the parts sorry. you can you know so i think you know doing listening is so easy you just have to watch movies or you know to watch your favorite series tv series and you can improve a lot but yeah talking to people well, Dave, going back to the going back to the Wikipedia thing, uh, there is something that we could we could tell to our listeners. There is this, uh, this Wikipedia, which is called Simple English Wikipedia. Oh, Simple English. Simple English Wikipedia. Oh, okay. I didn't know. So that's a Wikipedia in English that's been adapted for people who do not speak, who do not master the language that well. And it's a very simple, it's very simple, simple language. Okay, oh, that'll be great okay. for people. Okay, I'm going to write it down. You say Wikipedia in single, in simple English. Simple English Wikipedia. That's the name of the... Okay. Uh, the you know, I'm going to, I'm going to add, uh, when we, when we finish the conversation, I'm going to add uh, a link to all the resources that we're mentioning. Yeah. That's great. And also, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a, it's an aside experience of mine. 
what helped me out with the listening, now that you mentioned that the listening is so important, was simply listening to my favorite songs. We in Spain listen to a lot of uh, music in English, li- uh, reading the lyrics and listening to the song at the same time. Yeah, repeating, yes. I mean, that's a very simple thing. I think we all have done it. And I think that helps out a lot. Yeah, I know, you know, um, one of the, one of the podcasts in the to-do list that I've got is with Christian. You know, Christian is a friend of ours who is, you know, he, he learns how to speak English without studying. You know, he, he didn't do a stroke, you know, he never studies, but he learned through, you know, Linkin Park, Eminem. And it's so good because, because if you can sing, if you're able to sing Eminem songs, you know, rap songs, you, you know, you've got pretty yeah, you're good. good. Yeah. You're good. You're good to go. <laughs> exactly. Okay. That's, that's so cool. Really, really, really good. Okay. Now, finally, just uh, as a final touch. Um, okay. What, what advice would you give to somebody starting right now? You know, somebody with an intermediate level or of a low level. What are the, you know, can you summarize the, the best tips? Well, what I would say, Dave, is uh, simply um, um, to think, to know that it's going to take a very long time to master the language. It's not, it's not an easy thing to do, okay? So someone might be uh, learning the language three years in an academy and then uh, be on the street and meet a native speaker and not be able to communicate well with them, okay? Some of these people, after three years in an academy, go back home look at themselves in the mirror and they say, man, I suck. Okay. I cannot do this. This is not good for me. Yeah. I say, no, you know, you're trying, uh, next time you meet a native speaker, see it as a chance to do it better than the, than the, than, than the last time. And just think that it's a very long process. You see it as a very long process. Mm-hmm. Then also uh, the main advice that I would give to someone starting right now, is what I've said. Uh, try to try to learn vocabulary, new words. I would say, for example, just as an example, uh, if you can uh, set yourself to learn 10, 20 words per week, new words per week. Uh, try to be very constant. Uh, language is all about being constant. You cannot say with language, okay, I'm going to study six months. Then the next six months, I'm going to forget it. And then after six months, I'm going to start again. No. You have to be month after month doing it, learning it, being constant. Because if not, you're going to forget stuff. And what you want to do is to build, to build that language within yourself. And that takes a lot of effort. So summarizing points, to know it's going to take a long time, to be able to be very constant about it. And uh, if you come across situations in which uh, you think of yourself as not capable of doing it, just remember that we all have been there. We all have felt bad about ourselves. But if you keep on being constant and if you really want to learn the language, eventually, eventually, you'll get there. So just keep on being motivated. Keep calm and carry on. <laughs> keep calm and carry on. Exactly. Exactly. Basically, yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Terrific. Okay, so... I think we, you know, you pretty much uh, summarized everything, you know, summed up all the points. We've got the, the vocabulary, being constant and having, I think, you know, the, the main insights that we can get from this conversation is American accent is easier and motivation is key, you know? I think yeah, being motivated is the most important thing for pretty much everything in life. So, and yeah. also, And also understand, understanding the, uh, the expectations you got to have with a language, okay? I... I've talked to some people who told me, I'm going to start learning German or learning English. And in three months, in three months, I'll be able to speak it. That's unrealistic. That's unrealistic. You have to be realistic and you have to know it's a work that's going to take years. Okay. So just take it, just take it as it is and be constant and be cool with that. And eventually, eventually, if you are able to, to have that mindset, you'll be able to speak it and uh, maybe, uh, do a podcast for your, for, your, uh, for teacher uh, Dave here. <laughs> yeah, which is an awesome podcast, I speak, you know. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to speak in German now. My German was coming out. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, that's pretty much the this interview with Marcelo Viedma. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, man, for talking with me today. And it was a really, really cool interview.
Okay, so that was the interview with Marcelo. And I have to say, it was really cool. And we had such a good time talking. I hope you enjoyed this and learned a lot. And I suppose, I imagine it, it must have been, um, you know, it, it can be difficult to, to understand a different person with a different accent. But as I said at the beginning of the podcast, that's really, really helpful, you know? That's what you have to do. So if you didn't understand the whole thing, you can now read the, the notes that I have on the article on that way and you can follow the notes and at the same time you can listen or you can download the mp3 file and listen and listen again until you understand everything, okay? So I hope you enjoyed the podcast. I hope you liked this and... You know, just remember that you're listening to thatwayingles.com and I hope to see you next time, okay? Next week I'll have more and more awesome podcasts for you. So stay tuned and take care.